On today's episode of Blatantly Honest with Michaela Nichols, I caught up with Nancy Conrad. She's a recognized leader in transformative education and has been named one of the top 100 leaders in STEM education. Nancy also founded the Conrad Foundation. Her late husband, Pete Conrad, was the third man to walk on the moon during the Apollo 12 mission. It's an honor to have you on the show today discussing all things space and your story. If you don't build your dream, someone else will hire you to build theirs. Wow. Isn't that cool? Is it? That's the truth, honestly. Yeah, that's absolutely the truth. You know, as Bill Gates used to say, don't, don't uh, insult the, the geek. He might be the boss you end up working for. <laughs> <laughs> honestly, honestly. I know geeks are always smart and we need a lot of them. So we call it geek is chic. <laughs> geek chic, yes, definitely. So speaking of all that, what made you want to become a teacher? Oh, wow. So back in the day when I was young, there were three things women could do, secretary, nurse, teacher. So my typing wasn't too great. I wasn't excited about blood. And I'm a storyteller, so teaching just came very natural to me. Wow. My mom was a teacher, so I have great respect for teachers. I know it's not easy and takes a lot of patience. Yeah, but it was, um, I loved it. I mean, I just had a ball of teaching. I, I, um, I taught senior high school students uh, and I taught English and I'm terrible at grammar. I mean, I can do it. I know how to do it, but teaching it was not exciting to me, but I love teaching um, things like T.S. Eliot and Shakespeare and all the stuff the kids got to read because I had a professor when I was in university that I took Shakespeare class from him and he read every single play Every single character, he was the character, and he went like through all of the major Shakespearean plays, including sonnets and all kinds of things. And I thought, wow, Shakespeare rocks. <laughs> He's awesome. Honestly. And so I sort of learned the, the, the technique of teaching through improv, which is just storytelling. And, and I lit up, so I figured kids I was teaching would light up, and so they did. Wow. What a unique way to, to combine teaching and storytelling. So did you know that that was your calling, you know, storytelling? Did you think it was going to progress into where you're at today? I had no idea. I had no idea. I mean, you know, things happened in my life where it just required me to read the tea leaves and kind of just respond to things that were happening. Um, kind of a little bit of serendipity and a lot of fairy dust. And so that's, yeah, so that was how I responded. I could not have told you when I was a young woman that I would end up doing this. I have always had a passion for teaching and for education. And my mother was a very good joke teller. I'm a terrible joke teller. I cannot remember a joke I've heard. My mother could tell you a joke she heard 50 years ago. And a bridge hand she had 20 years ago. She had a memory of an elephant. But that's not me. Um, I, I can tell, I can weave stories for you and I can tell you about things, but I'm not a joke person. Or, you know, and I don't play bridge. So. Except I majored in bridge in college. That's a whole other story. Wow. Oh, so no, no, my freshman year, bridge, boys and knitting. Mm -hmm. Oh my god. <laughs> what a combo. Yeah, it was not a good combo. <laughs> Didn't wow. work. Didn't hey. Work. Well, you know what? You tried, so. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, no, to answer your question, I would have never imagined. I would have never imagined the life I had and still have. It's different. It's taken different turns, but I could never have predicted the trajectory of my life. So where was that turning point from when you were teaching and, you know, doing your storytelling and then boom, everything changed. What was that moment like? Uh, boy, that was a long 22 year. I called it my inscaping when I, when I really began to understand, you know, I wrote my master's thesis on Alice in Wonderland and the, the Cheshire cat has the most important question you could ever ask. Who are you? So, I mean, I went from college to marriage to children to blah, 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 and I never got to that question until I got there. 
And when I got there, I, I really went through what I call my inscaping period, where I really began to study the who of who I am. And then the who takes you to the why, and the why takes you to what you're supposed to do. So all of that led to big transitions in my life. Among them was uh, the divorce um, after 22 years of marriage. And then I'm remarried, and um, I was just lucky. I mean, after I had done my whole landscaping and really began to get who I am, enter the world of my life. I mean, it was just amazing that the timing of it was so magical. And um, I married my second husband um, in 1990, and, and we had 12 magical years together, and then he was killed in an accident. So, end of that magic. So, um, you know, and, and, and I, I really, that really led me to the work I do now. And, and I would have never imagined, you know, I guess out of tragic, you can make magic and that's kind of what we did. So I, I combine my passion for what I call full education. You know, what we do in the classroom is we push. We push down, we got the sage on the stage and a little complacent kids and, and the teachers up there telling them everything that they need to know, but there's no why. There's mm -hmm. just no why. And until you get to the why and the who, I mean, there's nothing there. It's just done. So the kind of educator I am is, is a pull. So how do I pull out of you what your passions are, what you want to learn about? How can you take everything you know and go create something out of nothing and solve a big challenge? I mean, it's really John Dewey's theory of education that goes all with that. But so I took that kind of learning, and and I'm an entrepreneur, a recovering entrepreneur. I'm also a recovering optimist, and um, I took that piece and my passion to change the way kids can learn through pull, not push, and combined it with my late husband's legacy. And outcomes, Conrad Challenge. And this is our 15th year. I cannot believe, I don't know where 15 years went. Wow. So, yeah. 15 years. Yeah. Oh and I mean, Pete's story is quite an extraordinary story. Pete, this is my late husband. And he was a kid that um, was at a very prestigious school. And he had trouble reading and spelling. And they didn't know what dyslexia was in those days, and they just thought he was dumb. He was lump and everything. He hated school. And um, so they threw him out. You're kidding. They politely asked him to depart. And so he gets expelled from this school, and his mom took him and found this little school in upstate New York that had a great reputation for dealing with problem children. He was a problem child. He took him to this little school. And he's learning how to fly about this time. He soloed when he was 16. And he gets there, and the headmaster of the school sees something in him. He had bright blue eyes, and he was just this bubble of energy and was just such an extraordinary, charismatic person, even as a child, I'm sure. So the headmaster responds and takes Pete under his wing and he ends up with a scholarship to Princeton. Yeah. Wow. Now, he could have been prison as Princeton because he, he was rowdy. Gets to Princeton and he became an aeronautical engineer. Well, two good reasons. He liked to fly and he didn't have to read or spell. Right. Makes sense. <laughs> Makes almost sense. So he went on to become a test pilot and then when President Kennedy wanted some guys to go to the moon, he liked to fly. He didn't really care where it went. He ended up four flights in space. He nailed a pinpoint landing on the moon on Apollo 12. Then he flew Skylab, which was our first space station, damaged it launch. He rescued the lab, and for that he was awarded a Congressional Space Medal of Honor. And then he uh, retired from NASA and the Navy, and he went to work in the aerospace industry. 
And I just, it's so funny, I just got an email about all of this. He worked with a group of guys in the desert, the White Sands Missile Range, they called Whistler, and they were working on next generation of rockets called SSTO, single stage to orbit. Goes up, goes around, comes down. The concept was to go from California to Italy in 45 minutes, find a low Earth orbit. Okay? This was the precursor to the whole privatization and commercialization of space. And in many ways, it was way ahead of some of the things that are actually 25 years later happening yeah. now. But really, you know, that was the, the framework that created what Branson, Musk, and Bezos are doing today. And it really stands on the shoulders of guys like Pete and the whole team he worked with. It was called the, the DCX. Um, it was quite a project. Mm-hmm. And in July, uh, July 8th, 1999, Pete went on a motorcycle ride with his best buddies that he wanted to do forever. And then he come home. He was in an accident and he was killed. Him. Well, he died in the hospital. And so, so yeah, uh, you know, my life is like going at Mach 7, everything's wonderful and perfect, and I hit a brick wall. And man, it took uh, a lot of years to even come up for air. I wrote his book, his biography. I work in patient safety to prevent medical error. And this whole thing just sort of evolved as a way to combine Pete's legacy and my passion and voila. So these kids combine education, innovation, and entrepreneurship and they solve global and local challenges. Now, that could be spaghetti at a wall, so we created, yeah, we created categories. So aerospace is our heritage, and we did um, energy and environment, cybersecurity and technology, health, that's three, uh, smoke-free world, and this year I believe we're gonna be working on the uh, plastics problem in oceans. Oh, especially with, you know, COVID and everyone throwing out these masks, you know, those re- and then you see they're, they're taking over the ocean and it's, it's sad because, you know, one thing's already killing the ocean. Now we got this. It's just, it's a big stinky mess. It really is bad. So our kids, so we've been taught that there are two ways to think of things in the box and out of the box, right? So we don't have a box. We don't say make this and if you make it better, you win. So we actually created, we have a head of education and professional development. We created a framework for how do you do innovation and entrepreneurship. So we call it the no box toolbox. (laughs) (laughs) What a name. (laughs) There's no box. And these kids come up with things, they're all over the place because it's not constricted. It's not, um, you're going to buy against other kids who are doing the same thing you are. There are competitions that do that. That's not us. So, so kids come up with things. It's just like, what? It's amazing. And many of them get patents. They own their IP. We don't own it. Some deploy their products. Some of them, we flip the switch of entrepreneurship, and they end up doing a different product, they end up as venture capitalists, they go to Stanford Business School, they go to Johns Hopkins, they go to Harvard, they're all over the place. Um, They go to Clarkson University, some of them go to small colleges, some go to Menlo College. Um, And and now we're working with South Carolina, their school down there. There's a bunch of universities now that give our kids scholarships because it's, you know, the cost of acquisition for one student is quite high. We've got fish in a barrel. So the universities look at our kids as like, oh wow, yes, come on down. So now we're top credentials for college admission and we're one of the top competitions in entrepreneurship. So it's quite extraordinary. It's exciting. This is our 15th year. Like I said, I don't know what time we are. So when, when this idea of, you know, the Conrad Foundation came about and obviously dealing with the loss of your husband, how soon was it after that, that all of this really started to gain momentum for you? (laughs) 
we started with 20 kids. Um, we actually held the competition in Las Cruces, New Mexico, right near White Sands, Missouri, which is where Kate was doing artists. And I don't know, we never, just in the last few years, we've done some social media and some outreach and this and that and podcasts and stuff. But up to, we never did a, a global outreach. So we've, all, I, I don't go to school, I don't schlep it. Um, we work through the students. So everything we do is student-centered. So we've taken the lens and the focus of the program to the consumer of education, and that would be the students. And so the students form their teams, they decide what category, they must work with an adult, it can be a parent, an amateur school, a teacher, could be a university student, as long as it's someone over 18, and the kids are 13 to 18. They work in teams, two to five, that was intentional, because when you are in a team, one, you're following the model of the way companies run today, Two, you're learning things like leadership, collaboration, cooperation, and communication. Yeah? And it's nuanced, so it's, but it's there. And the, it's a fun competition. It's difficult. It launches on the school year. Of course, we'll talk about that in a minute because that's kind of a whole other weapon. Uh, I know. <laughs> yeah, and um, and then we down select. They submit their portfolios online, and there is a rubric and judges on the back end. There are also subject matter experts, and um, they get numerical scores, and then we down select into semifinalists, and then from that, the kids write business plans, market studies and the prototypes. The prototype can be a drawing. It can be an actual prototype. Most of our kids prototypes. And then from that, we select our finance. Now, normally, uh, remember when life was BC, B, BC before yeah. Corona? Uh, <laughs> that's, yeah, honestly, that's the updated version of everything, BC. Gosh. So BC, we used to host our finals at Kennedy Space Center. And kids would come from all over the world and we would take five teams per category and they pitch in real time to judges. So this year we pivoted, I don't think around the first of February, we were one of the first to pivot onto an online competition and actually it was really awesome. Um, it, 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 it created different opportunities than the kids had at Kennedy and they were still able to network and have fun and we had a dance party and the whole business. Wow. Um, in fact, one of our directors showed up in a full disco outfit. It was hysterical. Um, Great. So the, the AC, the after Corona, led us to that model of that online finals. We don't know what's going to happen this year. Nobody knows. Um, and we just, we, we told the kids that on the February 1st, we'll make an announcement whether we're going to be virtual or in real time, can be. And we may, I don't know, it could be an every other year thing, I don't know. Um, there's magic at Kennedy Space Center, obviously. It's sort of the epicenter of American in innovation, mm -hmm. and it's our legacy. And we, we work closely with NASA and this and that, but um, it's hard for kids to travel from all over the world. Of course. But, but the experience is so extraordinary that they all talk about it and everybody wants to be there. So I don't know. I mean, yes, we do have done now some, some outreach and social media and things like that. When you move the lens to the consumer, it's, it's a different entry point, And that's something for you to think about than going to schools and working through superintendents and principals. And it's very difficult to get a platform into a school, very difficult. Very. But what happens with ours, yes, I'm sure you experienced it, what happens with ours is the kids grab it and the teachers who many of just are kind of in a coma because it's boring. I mean, they're as boring as the kids are. Um, they take it and they teach their whole science class through our competition, which is kind of interesting. So we'll have some schools with 15, 20 teams that come into the competition. and. Just footnote, we have never been about quantity. 
we have been about quality. And that focus on high level, really uh, innovative breakthrough ideas is where our kids just shine. They're just amazing. They just blow our minds. That's so fun. I'm sure. And it's fun. That's the most important. Because if it <laughs> weren't fun, Pete Conrad would be furious at me. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. It had to be fun. Yeah. Wow. So with I know you focus a lot with STEM. What do you think the relevance and importance is with STEM in our youth? Well, so uh, I'm not a STEM person, personally. I mean, I'm, I'm on the creative side and I'm in the humanities side and, and I'm a philosophy major and, and uh, English master's studies and that's not my world. So I don't even understand math. I'm terrible at math. Me too. I'm just terrible at it, but I'm, I'm a systems thinker. And so I kind of can glide through many of these things because I think in very high level, like 30,000 foot systems of, of overlays of structures on the things and how can we improve this through collaboration. And I'm a big fan of radical collaboration. So STEM is important because it's really the epicenter of, of product development. You know, unless you're doing it, well, even if you're doing a knitting club, knitting needles had to do with how you make those and how you get the yarn. Everything really comes out of math. Music is math, art is math, the world is math. I'm terrible at math, but somehow I'm still alive. <laughs> still doing people, it. <laughs> now I've got people that help me with my math. Um, how it should be. <laughs> it's really, STEM is really the, the epicenter. Engineering is design thinking. Hmm? Math is, is the structure around which the whole earth is made. And uh, what's the word I want? Where, where everything, micro, uh, biomimicry. It's where everything, yeah, biomimicry is, if you look at practically everything that is here, whether it's buildings or anything, it mimics biology. It mimics animals. It mimics flowers. It, it's fascinating. It's a fascinating study. I'm learning more and more about it. That's something I do all the time too. I keep learning things. Um, so STEM is, you know, science is the, the, the whole center of the universe. So really important that kids know that. What happens in our work is that they take all of that that they've learned and then they stretch it and then they go make something that nobody's ever done. Yeah. And voila. Boom, something new. So aside from all the STEM and the creation and innovation, do you drive home any other crucial messages, especially with, you know, your love for humanity? Especially for what? You know, you, you mentioned that you loved humanity and collaboration and yeah, well, I mean, I'm an, I'm more on the creative artsy side. Mm -hmm. Um so I, I think one of the most important things we teach inadvertently because we don't do push um, through our competition is the following. So when the astronauts went to space and they looked back at Earth from the moon, they saw a fragile blue planet suspended in a black velvet sky, no borders, no boundaries. We do that. So these kids, these Gen Z kids, they have grown, they're the digital natives. They've grown up on the internet. They work together from across states, countries, cities, socioeconomic, gender groups. They don't care. And they see the world because of their digital nativeness, if you will, the same way the astronauts do. And they want to participate in making a better world. They're very purpose driven. So everything that we've done and do is purpose-driven innovation. Um, and that perception is really the little beautiful pearl inside the oyster of what we do. Yeah. Well said, that's brilliant. So with everything, you know, the, the no borders, I love that because I think we're unfortunately in a society where 
we're seeing those borders and those barriers and we're trying to say, let's get over them and let's move on. And some people don't grasp that, unfortunately. So <laughs> what, what advice do you have for kids who feel like they're held back by these borders? Uh, you know, I, I look at my husband's legacy. And there's a story that you can tell yourself because he just found his own passion. And once you go back to the, the, the Cheshire Cat, who are you? Find your passion and follow your passion because that opens everything, and your mind, your skills. And most of these kids, you know, we live in bubbles. I look at, like I was watching the news last night, which I seldom watch because I can't handle it anymore. It's too depressing. And there were people in cars with their trunks up getting food for the first time in their whole lives. I mean, my God, what's happened to this world is just horrible. Now, you can focus on that and you can be sad and you need to focus on it. You need to be sad. But you can also take that as an opportunity to create a solution. So what's happening in the schools right now is horrendous. Most teachers have, I am one, I mean, I love teaching, but, but in a two-dimensional plane, some of them have trouble being the stage on the stage. So how are you going to relate to someone you can't even, they're not in the classroom and this and that. Um, and the need to um, change education, we can't, we can't um, reform it. There's nothing to reform. It's just, it's dead. It's 200 years old and it needs to go away. So this has actually led to a fabulous opportunity to redesign the whole education platform. And I'm working with bunches of groups looking at that as collaborators. Um, so that's the opportunity. And I already forgot the question you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. No, you, you were nailing it. So okay. question, question was irrelevant. So yeah. I, liked, I liked where you uh, took it. I, think I, I coined a word, I think I shared this with you, what's called opportunity. Every obstacle can become an opportunity. It's up to you to make that happen. You can focus on the on the hearts, so there's two things. This is, now you're gonna get my whole philosophy of life. And this, I didn't create this. This guy named Jerry Jampolsky, brilliant guy. He was a friend that lived in San Francisco. I don't know if he's still alive. There's two things. It's really simple. There's love and there's fear, and that's all there is. Because anything else you look at is the child of one of those things. So if you're looking at jealousy, that's fear. If you're looking at war, that's fear. If you're looking at hatred, that's fear. If you're looking at racism, that's fear, right? So flip to the other side. You're looking at creativity, that's love. You're looking at um, music, that's love. I could go on and on and on, but you get the point. I'm a simple person. That just makes so much sense to me. Mm -hmm. So I tend to look at whatever situation I'm in and come to it through the love lens rather than the fear lens, which is why I've turned off the news. <laughs> I don't blame you. I'm with you on that one. Yeah. So you have just had so many unique experiences in your life and you've traveled all across the globe, which I'm sure has just opened your eyes and made you view the world with a beautiful lens. So where has your favorite appearance been? My favorite, if there is one. My your favorite, favorite, yeah, favorite place I've been in? Any, any, whether it was a, a speech you gave or a place oh, you've favorite traveled. Appearance, favorite appearance? Yes. appearance? <sighs> well, I think it was about a year ago. I did the graduation speech at the American School of Paris. <sighs> Spectacular place. It was just amazing. I mean, that was BC. And I looked at that and I thought, was that just a year ago? It was. Um, 
I had so many adventures with Pete. We flew a helicopter from Arizona to Venezuela, the two of us. Unbelievable experience. Wow. We, we did several of those kinds of things. Um, I don't know. Usually when people ask me, you know, what's the favorite place you've ever been? I say, where I am. <laughs> that's that's a good answer. <laughs> I am, um, but th th that's those are kind of two adventures that kind of stay in my mind. I can't. I, I've done quite a lot of speaking over the years. Um, I don't do much of it anymore. I'm not sure why. I really enjoy it, but a lot of these big things like TED and all that stuff aren't happening anymore. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm now very much focused on my work because I have, um, there's a lot to do. So you gotta show up and do the work. Yes. I, I did an interview years ago. I used to do, write a lot of for magazines. And I interviewed this woman. Um, she was the CEO of a huge mutual fund. She's British. And I asked her, I said, well, what's your five-year plan? She said, I don't do a five-year plan. And I said, really? She said, yeah, because if I do a five-year plan, I might miss something that comes along the way. Now that's smart. Yeah, that's most cool. people say, what's your one year, your three year, your five year? So we do one for the for the foundation stuff because it's kind of the de rigueur of having a not for profit in answering these questions and stuff. But I personally, I don't have a one, two, three, five year. I just roll. It is how I roll. <laughs> Me too. It's like meeting you. That was a happenstance. So if I had a, a plan in place that didn't make time for new adventures and new people, I wouldn't have ever met you. So that would be pretty silly, right? It would be silly. And I'd be sad because oh, I would <laughs> I have a lot to learn. <laughs> yeah, well, and we would not have had this great intersection. Of, you know, you're a young person trying to do good work in education. I'm an old person trying to do good work in education. And then I always say, you know, how can we help you? How can we work together? I'm a big collaborator. It, and it's strange for a lot of people because they don't, and that's up to them. Um, I was on a call the other day and working with an unbelievable global group of people working together to kind of design what happens next, kind of, you know? Because we have to, we have to think about it. We have to figure it and, out. Um, these are people that really understand radical collaboration. Not everyone does. And people will silo off and they won't help you and they'll just say, well, you'll figure it out. I tend to see the world the way the astronauts do incredible that's a good way to view the world and speaking of the way astronauts do did pete ever say anything to you that stood out about his personal experience in space and on the moon i mean the third man to walk on the moon like i can't i don't know how you can like wrap your head around that just like as as his wife and just for me even just thinking about that like how is that whole experience for you so Yes, that's a multi-pronged question. It is. <laughs> so he was a character. He was um, full of life, but never full of himself. That's extraordinary. And he was fun, and he was funny. And people would say, well, what was it like being on the moon? And he had a one-word answer. Super. <laughs> He went to the moon with his two best friends. They had a, a, an amazing adventure, a dangerous adventure. They were struck by lightning at liftoff. Yeah, NASA's never launched again in foul weather. If you saw the launch of SpaceX a few weeks ago and the weather was foul, they've never done it after that. Because the, the rocket becomes a lightning rod and bam -o, And so the whole computer system just went <clears throat> Yeah, anyway. Pete's with his two best friends. They had a ball, they giggled the whole time. He had a bet with a journalist who thought that Neil's words were written by the government. And he said, absolutely not. So they had a $500 bet. And um, 
about what he would say. And so the first thing he said was whoopee, because they had done a pinpoint landing, you know, and, and there's a whole backstory to all of that. But so there they were exactly where they were supposed to be. And then he said exactly the words that they had made this $500 bet about. And those words were, well, it may have been a small one for Neil, but it was a big one for a little guy like me. He was the shortest guy in the, in the astronaut. And he came back and she never paid him the 500 bucks. Never paid. So I put it in my book and then I got this very threatening letter from her and her publisher and all this stuff that they would sue me. So I took it out of the book. That was one of the dumbest things I've ever done because if I'd have left it in the book and she would have sued me, that's book sales, dummy. Mm -hmm. I, I'd do it over again, <laughs> you know. I could Write a short it. story, maybe. Yeah, man, it's over. I don't care anymore. But um, yeah, Pete, Pete, there's one of the last interviews he did was with the BBC. And we were out at White Sands Missile Range and he's sitting there on his motorcycle. And the guy says to him, do you look up at the moon and think, gee, I've been there? And Pete said, well, I don't sit around thinking about what I did. I sit around thinking about what I'm going to do. And that was his whole being. He was just filled with life and fun and funny and just an adorable human being. Oh. Yeah. I'm sure he's very proud of you and everything that you're doing. Well, if he's, you know, I, I hope so. Well, you're doing phenomenal work. Well, we are, I, we have an alumni group that one of our, I brought one of our alumni onto our board of directors and probably the best thing I ever did. And that young man created the Alumni Leadership Council and there are kids all over the world now. There's hundreds of them that have been part of our group, that participate as alumni, and some are in the leadership council. They're doing extraordinary work. They are really the glue that works with the kids, that brings them into the family. It's a very intimate community with these kids. It's, I don't want 250,000 kids in the Coliseum Center. It's not what we do. This mm -hmm. is family, it's intimate. So when people ask me, how many kids do I have? I say thousands. <laughs> because they write me, I hear from them, I know what they're doing. Um, it, it's great fun and it's very fulfilling and it's joyful. So sure. that's living in the love place, right? You have to, you have to live in that love place, especially, especially now, more crucial than ever. Even if you've had things that have happened to you that aren't in the love place, it's the Tai Chi, you turn the dark to light and you push it back out as positive. Yeah. So how do you see your own legacy someday? Oh man, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I, I named my successor, um, so that feels good. And I, it's not something I think about. I just do my work. Because if I start messing around with that stuff, I think get all caught up in my own thing. I don't want to do that. It's not, it, uh, I just, the one that, that I raised the money, I have to do that. I funded the first two years at Al Green very quickly. And my kids were going to put me up for adoption <laughs> instead of their bread. And so I, now I, I get funders behind this, sponsors and donors and, um, such and so that's my job and that's what I focus on and I focus on bringing new opportunities to, to the work so I'm working on a couple of really cool things for this year so hopefully I can get them funded and that'll take off but if not I'm the one that knows about it I don't want to disappoint anybody so I, I, I don't really think about my legacy anymore than I think about my five-year plan I don't <laughs> yeah. I like that. No, it's a good way to be. Life's too short to keep thinking way, way out, you know? Enjoy the moment. Just purpose of life, Pete Conrad, philosophy of life. It's just about fun. That's all there is. And he had a lot of fun. So I, I subscribed to his philosophy. You know, he just, he knew it. What a story, you know? 
and you're carrying it on and everything you're doing is very admirable. So I really appreciate you, you sharing your story with me and with of everyone. Course. My pleasure to do so and thank you for the good work you're doing. Thank you. No, I'm happy to help you. Be bold, be you, be blatantly honest and rock and roll and have a good time while you're doing it. <laughs>